From the crossroads of America in the Hoosier state of Indiana, this is Get In, the podcast focused on the unfolding stories and extraordinary innovations happening right now in the heartland. I'm Matt Hunkler, CEO at Powder Keg, and I'll be one of your hosts for today's conversation. I am joined in studio by co-host, Christopher Toaf Day. Hello. Sometimes known as a little ball of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And Nate Spangle, new nickname. head of community at Powder Keg. And on the show today, we have Sarah Cotterell, CEO of Shift Edibles and co-founder of The Human Array. Because hemp is this awesome plant. It legalized across the country in 2019. And hemp has a really long taproot which what it does is it goes down and aerates the soil. So you think of all those earthworms, right? It does that. Sarah Cotterell is the co-founder of The Human Array and CEO of Shift Edibles. And today we're going to cover all kinds of interesting topics and I'm very excited about it because we're gonna talk about regenerative health, potentially therapeutic uses of THC and cannabis, and just having fun in work and life. And I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Sarah, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Toe. This is going to be one of our most interesting podcasts to date. I think we're already having fun in work and life. So that's check. 100%. That's what it's all about, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sarah, how did you get into this amazing world that you're in? exploring how to live more richly, regenerative health, living a fuller life, fun, things that don't often get talked about. I'm a lawyer by training, so don't hold that against me. So that's how. The law school is definitely the gateway to fun. (laughs) And I will not go minute by minute so that we can charge by every increment. (laughs) So I'll give you the notes version, but I grew up here in Indianapolis, went to the University of Virginia undergrad, came back and went to Bloomington for law school, and then started out my career at Ice Miller doing healthcare, corporate, and regulatory work. And I worked with hospitals and physician systems and everything in the business side of healthcare. Did that for almost 10 years, then left, went in-house, and worked with a company where we bought and sold hospitals right at the time that Obamacare was happening, which was super interesting. I have a lot of good stories that are best shared over cocktails or something else (laughs) probably, and learned a lot about having a small business in some ways, because with that business, you never quite knew if they were going to go public or go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So there were lots of ups and downs, and then you add the healthcare regulations on top of that, which made it even more interesting. I was doing a lot of traveling with that, came back and joined American Health Network as general counsel and a whole host of of other oh. things, and then we sold that company to Optum, which is a subsidiary of United Health Group, and ran that integration. And in part, with help from the universe, decided that wasn't what I wanted to be when mm. I grew up. And T- tell me a little bit more about that with help from the universe, deciding <laughs> it wasn't what you want to be. Things just happen. American Health Network, before we sold, was a group of 400 plus providers, mostly primary care, Indiana, Ohio. And we went through a really interesting strategic planning process, which was who was our customer. And we decided that the physician was actually our customer, that if the physician showed up to work every day and they had everything that they needed in their toolkit, if they were happy to be at work, if they were enthusiastic, if they were motivated, then their patients would get the absolute best care. And so with that in mind, we went out and looked for strategic partners, talked to hospital systems, talked to private equity, venture capital, that type of stuff, because healthcare was evolving and we needed more money, bigger platform to keep serving the the patients that we were serving. So Optum was that partner and did provide a number of those things, but Optum is a Fortune 6 company. And so when you go from a small healthcare provider, small in the the overall state of thing, in the grand scheme, to that much power, structure, Structure. yes, all of a a sudden, what you're doing wasn't what you were doing. And for me, I felt like I wasn't able to innovate, I wasn't able to really affect change, I'm slightly disillusioned with the healthcare system, the way it is. I think it's a disease management system and poor at best. I think there are a lot of amazing people that work within it that are well-intentioned, but the system as a whole could use some revamping. 
And I had some things that happened in my personal life at the same time, some relationships that kind of really blew up. Mm. And I looked around and I thought, oh my gosh, for my kind of long-term health well-being, there was something inside of me that said, you can't do this. And it really had to come to that, like I had a be still and no moment where it got really quiet and all of a sudden my intuition went, you have to do it differently. And so that's the path that I've been on ever since. And I would like to tell you it's a nice straight, neat path and it is not. It never is. It is very winding and circuitous. And yes, it's all sorts of crazy. Did it happen in a moment like that? Was it like a lightning strike kind of moment? Or was it something that you're almost like meditating on over time and it's evolved? So the be still and no moment happened in an instant. Wow. It took me a while to listen to it. Mm. And I think it had to hit me over the head because I think it had been trying to quietly bubble up and I'd had these thoughts here and there, but no, like I'm not going to totally turn my life upside down and go into this unknown state because in many ways, that's what it was, the unknown. And I'm not one that traditionally had liked the unknown. I like to know what's happening next and how it's happening. So so what were some of the high level connection points that, so you were in, so you started off in law, you get into healthcare, growth company, exit to a major strategic and then you enter into this life of organic wellness natural which we could probably get into that later too the whole what's natural Mm -hmm. right isn't always natural but what were some of those connection points so there's this moment that you talk about you you need to listen to that moment what were whatever you feel comfortable sharing like what were some of the connection points that took you from this corporate executive to I'm going to chart my own path and pursue my passion. Mm -hmm. I think when I look back, I've always been a questioner. Mm -hmm. So I always want to know the, the why and my kids will be like, Oh my God, could you please stop asking me so many questions? But I'm just, I'm so curious. I want to know, I want to know, I want to know. And my mom was a big gardener, a master gardener, Mm. incredible, grew all of my vegetables growing up. So I had that in me on some level. My grandparents had giant flower gardens, even when they moved into the nursing home, right? They were those people and they were taking all of their friends around in the nursing home. My daughter, when she was little, ended up having some relatively minor health issues that kind of traditional medicine wasn't Mm -hmm. solving. And I kept looking and kept peeling back and kept peeling back. Turned out she had candida, which is an overgrowth of yeast in your system. And her pediatrician at the time was like, oh, kids just get this stuff. Oh, it happens. And I'm like, it doesn't just happen. And so we were never getting to the root cause of the issue. So I had all of these little things. And then I ended up to help her get rid of candida, basically made the majority of her food for a year of her life. And I was one that before that had bought food and arranged it on a plate. Like cooking was not one of my loves, passions, or skill sets at all. So I had those learnings that happened. And then I had all of a sudden this time when I said, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. And everybody was like, you're going to have to go teach yoga because they've done yoga forever and ever. You're going to have to take on other legal jobs. You're going to have to do this. And I'm like, "Mm, I'm not. I had a coach, thankfully, that said to me, don't do anything that feels heavy. Oh, I like that. Don't like that too. Oh, I like that a lot. And I live by that to this day. It doesn't mean it's not hard. It doesn't mean you don't struggle. It's not a challenge. But there's something about that heaviness that you anchor around your neck. Yeah. Just don't do it. You go, I'm not doing it. It seems like you went from this moment where you were really struggling to listen to yourself and or the universe. And the universe had to beat you over the head with it a couple of times, it sounds like. It sounds since then you've really pardon the gardening uh, analogy, but like cultivated this ability to listen and tune in to yourself. I feel like that's a superpower. And with a lot of the guests we've had here on the show, the people who really are true to themselves and listen and follow their path are the ones that seem like they're able to accomplish incredible things, are happy in their life and in work. And so I'm curious for you, what did you learn? How did you learn to do that? And what are some of the I don't, I don't want to call them tricks, but like techniques or strategies that you might recommend someone trying if they're trying to get more in tune with their own inner voice and or the universe or God or whatever you want to call it. I'd say I have a, a combination and I am definitely still learning and now it gets me really excited about it. 
patience is forever one of my life lessons. And I know that I want to know the answer and I want to know it now. And so recognizing that's a challenge was something that was important for me. And I think that's a big part of it, taking a step back and saying, what lens am I viewing this through and why? All of a sudden you're like, oh, there is a different way to look at it. And there's a great quote, and I won't get it exactly right, by the Dalai Lama. And he says, basically, when the world looks bad, look at a flower. There's another truth. I really like that. How do we shift our paradigm? And then when you get into the nitty gritty, for me, some of it was, I have to move my body. I have to walk. I have to walk. And when I don't know what to do, I either walk or I do yoga. And all of a sudden, things start to, to clear up. I've gotten Align. better. Align. Yeah. They do. And all of a sudden, that answer, I'll be like, oh, that's what I need to do. All of a sudden, when I'm not thinking about it, yep. the answer comes. So take us back, right? You're working at American Health Network. Mm -hmm. You guys get acquired or strategically invested, and then you decide this isn't for you. Put your two weeks in, last day of work, you wake up on Monday, the next week, and what did you do? Where did you start? Walking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So we'll like, we'll honestly, I think I went to you. I was in the best shape. I, I'm still... Like I, I still do all those things, yeah. but I went to yoga class and I walked and I lunched. Like I, I saw all the people that I hadn't had time to see and I saw friends of their friends or connections of their friends. I really spent a bunch of time talking to people that I thought were interesting and listening to podcasts on things that I thought were interesting and reading on things that I, and it just kept following that path. Were there a couple of particular books or podcasts that you can look back and like, that was a pivotal book or article or podcast. I think it's hard for me because I'm such a consumer sure. of all of those things. So Zach Bush yeah. out of Charlottesville, Virginia, does a bunch of connecting the soil to human health oh, for wow. me. And that was huge because all of a sudden the language that he was using, I went, oh my gosh, my personal health is so dependent on what I put in and on my body. What I put in and on my body really depends on the soil and the way that it, in which it was grown. So you can put the organic label on things all day long and it may still be nutrient dense food. There are just like nine things you can't do to that. And so that's what really started for me. All right, so now we're going to start getting into the, some juice, some meat here. And we were already in the meat. It's place, actually but. vegetables because it's grown. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> but cannot meat be organic? And okay, okay, double click into it. <laughs> All right, so before we start into that, I may be wrong, but my personal belief is that there might be some misnomers, some myths around different terms and what things are out there with the, the population whole, as a whole. So to make sure all of our listeners are on the same page, can we just do some level setting with what is THC versus cannabis versus CBD versus organic versus natural? Like what are the swim lanes that, that we should be thinking about these things? Like what's what and what's illegal, what's legal in versus in, in various states, et cetera. Yeah. So let me back you up okay. a little bit first because they're, they're different categories, right? There are the labels that would go on food or products, yep. right? So you could have, Conventionally grown, which means a whole host of things can be sprayed on it, including glyphosate, including 2,4-D. It's your traditional farming practices of what we think of today. Then you get and into... Those are, so those are herbicides or pesticides. Are, quote-unquote mm -hmm. accepted by yep. USDA or whomever. Yes. Then there's organic. And organic says you can't do a certain number of things. And a lot of those are you can't spray a glyphosate or something like that. And glyphosate is one of the most prominent out there. It gets sprayed on GMO crops. It's really why we have GMO crops. When you think about it, everybody's demonizing GMO, which is genetically modified. It's not the genetic modification that's a problem. That's been happening through evolution. The problem is we've GMO'd these crops so that we can spray things like glyphosate on them. So if you spray glyphosate on wheat, for example, it acts as a desiccant, so it dries out the wheat so you can harvest it faster earlier. It also kills certain other weeds and things like that. That glyphosate is a water-soluble toxin, right, which means it really is never going away. So even the most organic of things 
have glyphosate in some way because it is in our rainwater, right? It is in our air. And when it gets into our bodies, what it does is it breaks apart the tight junctions of our gut lining. So your gut has these nice little things and they fit together. And when they fit together, it's this very thin boundary. When you think about it, we, we talk about boundaries in our personal lives, things like that. In our body, these boundaries are so important because they keep out what shouldn't be there and they keep in what should be there. So when your tight junctions break apart in your gut, all of a sudden we have these leaky gut, these things that start to happen. And when that happens, we create inflammation in our body, systemic inflammation. So when you're starting to see that, part of what has happened is really since 1996, we've been using glyphosate on, on all of our foods. And this isn't a show about glyphosate, so I can stop there. Is that part of why we've seen <laughs> such a growth in number of people who are like gluten-free? Like I, when, you, when I talk to my parents or people that are older than me, they're like, I don't remember anyone being gluten-free or gluten intolerant. The, are those two things related? I think they are. I'm not a physician and I'm not a scientist, but sure. I'm going to say that my gut says, <laughs> yes, nice. they are. I think that the when you go to Europe, a lot of their, especially their wheat and things like that, are raised differently. You're only allowed to raise so much, then it goes into a smaller bakery. They have smaller production of of foods and you'll notice it's easier on your system mm -hmm. because their farming practices are different. And I think things are starting to irritate our system more in a way that they wouldn't otherwise because we this systemic inflammation is growing and growing. And that is in part because of the tight junctions breaking apart. The other thing that happens when those tight junctions start to break apart is that we lose connection with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if you think about your cell phone, right? If you go, your cell phone works perfectly sitting here downtown Indianapolis, great, right? If you go to the middle of nowhere, Montana, <laughs> all of a sudden you are not having the connection that's happening. Your cell phone, the device itself still works perfectly, but you're not getting that connection. The same thing happens with glyphosate damage in our bodies and our cells. You can have a healthy cell that's in there that's saying, okay, I'm out here, then it gets damaged, and it's saying, hey, I'm damaged, anybody? And if that communication network isn't working, it thinks it's alone. So what does it do? It proliferates, mm -hmm. which is when you get cancer, you get some of these other things that start to happen. So the way our food is grown has a huge impact. And not only our food, but our soil. Really what we need to be talking about is how are we soil farmers? not how are we food farmers. And that was how I got into the love of hemp, to make a long story even longer. Because hemp is this awesome plant. It legalized across the country in 2019. And hemp has a really long taproot, which what it does is it goes down and aerates the soil. So you think of all those earthworms, right? It does that in, in hyper mode. And you can't spray all these glyphosates and these toxins on it. So all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, this is marrying everything that I love of the regenerative health and wellness to the regenerative agriculture. And here's a plant. And can we start to use this plant to not only change the trajectory of our health, but also to give farmers another tool to maybe transition farming away. And that's not an easy thing. That's a whole different subject. Um, farming is incredibly hard. Farmers have more faith than metal than anybody I know um, from being so close to it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard to go green if you're in the red. Well, we say, wouldn't this be lovely? There are a whole bunch of pieces that go into that. So then to get to your question, Toph, about cannabis, if you think of a pepper plant, right? There are a million different types of pepper plant. There's the red pepper plant and the yellow pepper plant and the jalapeno and this, that, and the other. Cannabis is the same way. We are using the overarching term of cannabis to talk about Delta 9 THC, which is also marijuana, right? But cannabis is this whole broad family of plants. And within that family is the hemp plant, which is what is legal across the country in every state. And that hemp plant is can be grown for fiber. So think about your paper, your insulation in cars, what they're starting to use it for. 
clothing, all of those kind of textile applications. You can grow the hemp plant for grain. So you think about hemp hearts or hemp protein powder, right? Or you can grow hemp plant for the cannabinoids that are in them. And those cannabinoids are where you get into the Delta-9 THC, the Delta-8 THC, the CBD, the CBG, and the list goes on and on. There are a hundred different cannabinoids and they all interact differently in our body. And they're all grown in the plant to some degree. And so you pick your seed and say, okay, this seed has been grown so that it has more CBD. And that's what we're going to harvest. And that's what we're growing the plant for. Now that plant, that CBD plant, will still have some delta-9 THC in it. That delta-9 does have a psychoactive property, but to be considered hemp, it has to be below a certain percentage, which is 0.3%. If it's above that, it's basically an illegal plant and you're supposed to destroy it and all that type of stuff. If you have a license to grow marijuana in the states where it's legal, then you're growing a slightly different plant and that delta-9 THC is higher. Does that make sense? Yep. So are you, so if you're farming, if you're growing hemp, then you're, there's different, I'm going to use the wrong word, but different strands or different seeds that grow different types of hemp that have different applications of which there are vast and many. And some, the end result product is what people think commonly is marijuana. But that's just a little piece of the world of hemp. It's, so you, it's a piece of the world of cannabis. So cannabis sorry, is really cannabis. the overarching yes, 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 thing. And then there, there's hemp and there's yes. marijuana and there's all of these then arguably synthetic type of things that basically like a Delta-8, right? Delta-8 is under scrutiny right now in a whole lot of places because Delta-8 exists in very small amounts in the plant, but you can take CBD and then through a process of chemical plus heat, you can create Delta-8. Synthetic, there's an argument, right? Is it synthetic? Is it not? This is part of what's happening at the federal level where um, some states have made it illegal. Some states have not touched it yet. Indiana, it sits in a question mark place. Texas, it's totally illegal. Florida, it's totally illegal. So you can, it, it is a state by state type of issue. And on a lot of that, you get down to follow the money. Because you have your traditional cannabis, your marijuana industries that are saying all of a sudden this Delta-8, which is coming from the hemp plant, which is less regulated, so less expensive, then is infringing on the sales of the traditional marijuana. And marijuana in most states is burdened with a lot of regulation, a lot of taxes. It's expensive to grow. It's expensive to buy. So that's where you get some of the controversy. So can we, the rest of the podcast, can we think about two buckets? Tell me if you like these two buckets, actually three buckets, because we want to talk about community. And then, and think about the bucket of the quote unquote substance that's illegal in some states, legal in some states and illegal in other states. And then the third bucket you mentioned on, or no, in and on earlier. I thought that was interesting. I really thought about that way. What you put in and on your body, the on Mm -hmm. part, I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I never thought about that way. Well, organic makeup or oils or lotion or whatever. That was my business I started after college. Really? The repurify. Was, yeah. when, that's why I started Powder Keg is I was struggling with that business. Interesting. I, I started it too early, basically. There wasn't enough search volume yeah. to be successful with it. It was about five years too early with it. Toe, fun fact, your skin is the largest, largest. organ on yes. your body, in oh, your true. body, on your body. That you <laughs> and, we don't, and we don't think, I think we don't wake up every day and think, we think about a heart in our lungs and our liver or whatever, but I think people don't really think about their skin a lot. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. No, you are. And let's talk about community right now based on yeah. that, because yeah. this leads into it. What we're doing with the human array is reconnecting people to their bodies so that they then can reconnect and evolve in community. Can we double click? I'm going to use the term double click into that because that seems very like philosophical and, and like conceptual. You need to reconnect with your body, and it's okay. I feel pretty connected right now. But it's, tell me on a and the listeners on an, an applicable level. Someone wakes up in the morning, listens to this podcast, and you, they hear you say reconnect with your body. What do they? What does that mean to the average listener? There's so many different things. We were just talking about your skin. Did you know your skin is your largest organ? Oh my goodness. Our bodies and nature, 
essentially the cosmos, our body. We've rewritten or we've written ourselves out of the definition of nature, by the way. Mm. If you didn't know, if you look yeah. in the dictionary, it excludes humans, which I think is a mistake. But so in my definition of nature, the human body is in there. You guys talk a lot about tech. Our bodies and our natural systems around us are the highest tech that exists on the planet. And we're creating all of this other cool tech, and it's starting to catch up in some ways. But we don't know what our skin does. Mm -hmm. We don't know how our gut works. We don't know about the fascia system. Do you know about the fascia? No, this what's is like fascia? my favorite I went to a Maya thing. fascia workshop and oh. it changed my life. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, 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 yes. I learned about a little, a little I, bit about that. I have no idea. Yoga. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Tell, give me that. Give me the flyover. So the fascia is basically all the interconnected tissue in your body. It is essentially made of collagens, um, structured water. It's why our bodies are really about a hundred percent water. It wraps every tissue, every organ. Your bones are basic. Your fascia just vibrating at a different speed, and it holds up your body. It's not your bones that hold up your body. It has more sensory neurons than your nervous system. It connects faster. And why, when you go to touch a tea kettle that's hot, you immediately pull your hand back is because of the way the fascia can connect in that quantum communication. So there's so much cool stuff that I think we're going to start hearing about your fascia and quantum biology. Hydration is a huge thing. So, right, keep drinking. We are all chronically dehydrated. So whether you take my view that we're about 100% water or you go with the traditional 70% water, when you now look around, the studies are saying people are about 68% hydrated. That 2% decrease in hydration causes all sorts of your issues. So when you go back to like, how do you know yourself and your body? If you're chronically dehydrated, nothing's functioning, nothing's talking the way it should in its body. Your brain isn't working. Easy ways like one super easy way is when you wake up in the morning, get your glass of water, put a little bit of that Celtic gray sea salt in it, maybe squeeze a lime into it. All of a sudden you're remineralizing and you're starting to structure the water in your body, which is what you need for your body to be the electromagnetic being that it is. Okay, electromagnetic being. I have a question. I don't know if you're going to know anything about this, but I want to ask it. One of my friends swears by every morning grounding himself. He takes off his shoes and walks outside. He lives in rural northern Indiana, walks around his property barefoot and says he needs to get grounded every morning. Is this a thing? This is a total thing. It's oh, I did it this morning. I sleep grounded, so I have a grounding mat on my bed. So yes. this goes into, again, your electromagnetic field. So we know there's positive, we know there's negative, right? Our body, because of all of the EMFs and just living, gets an excess of positive charge in it. The earth has, it has a negative charge, in part because of the way the lightning comes down, and I can't give you all the like exact science-y answers, but when you put your bare feet on the ground, especially like wet grass, all of a sudden, your body starts to come into polarity. It neutralizes. And so it does. It brings down inflammation. It brings down all of these things. So yeah, grounding is a super easy way, and it puts you outside. So if you can take your little glass of water with salt and lime, you can go out in the morning. It's hard this time of year because today it's gorgeous, but we start to get into cold and yuck. That's perfect because the more you tell Nate you can't do something, the more he's going to do it. <laughs> I will be out there in the snow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 15 minutes. If you can get 15 minutes on the ground and you can get your eyes to see that morning light. Matt is a huge direct sunlight into the eye guy. Does asphalt see? count as the ground or does it have to be on grass or dirt? Not really. Yeah. Yeah, concrete is better than asphalt um, because it's a little bit more conductive. But if you're going to spend the time, yeah. put your feet on the grass or the, the, grass the dirt. Down. And while you're at it, go hug a tree, right? right. That's pretty. And you start to get into the woo-ness of that. What are my neighbors going to think tomorrow morning when I'm out there hugging <laughs> some trees? I'm like, oh, yeah, this tree. <laughs> Dude, Please Lincoln. take a selfie and share it on LinkedIn. <laughs> yes, that I would love be it. fantastic. <laughs> Everyone Sarah Connor over. told me to do it. <laughs> That's great. I'll happily claim it. <laughs> I actually might do that. You should. You I'll should take a selfie. Climb the I'll tree. Get all the way up in it. Yeah, there you yes. go. Mm -hmm. Now, my 18-year-old will tell you that different trees have different energy. Yeah, that makes okay. sense. All right. 
you can feel them. And sh- it's funny, and she'll probably kill me for even saying this. She'll be like, I think the trees in Michigan are really happy. Like, they don't seem like they need a whole lot of hugs, but these other trees, they do. And she's That's gotten hilarious. so into I trees, she now plants trees with KIB, keeping it enough beautiful Great on a program. regular basis. Like, it's really nice. That neat. is so crazy that you just said that the trees in Michigan look happier. I was just up in southern Michigan, like over by the like Buchanan area, like just north of South Bend. And as I crossed the state line, it's right there on the St. Joe River. And I was like, man, these trees are really beautiful. And I'm only 15 miles north of Indiana. And the, I would, literally told my aunt, I was like, are the trees different around here? Like, they just look so full That's and the wild. color was great. And I like took, I took pictures, I took pictures of them. I was like, I don't take pictures of trees. I'm like, not a, <laughs> I'm not like a nature <laughs> landscaper. And I was like, these trees just look so beautiful. See, they're happy. And now wow. they know that you've noticed them. Wow. They're like, Maybe we can start a movement here good. in Indiana to have happier trees than yeah, Michigan. for sure. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> That's amazing. One hug at a time. <laughs> if you're listening, go hug a tree. Seriously, do it. <laughs> all right, so it. then then how do you think community with all of that? So how does that all, how do you feel like you connect? So whether it's the, your professional life, what you've moved into, or personal life, how has that manifested itself using these techniques? into improving community. Yeah. So I've been a studier of the the body in all of these different ways and other things and things like, okay, when you, uh, the bullet train didn't work until they changed the front of it to mimic the beak of the kingfisher, which is a bird we have out here, like at Geist, for example. Yeah. And when they did that thing can fly. So I had Not been- Not literally, but, but move, close. Move quickly. Move yes. really quickly. <laughs> yes, I guess we live in a world where things may be- Starting to fly. We so have some engineers yet. who listen to the <laughs> podcast. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> I don't know. Can you guys make it fly? But it's that kind of biomimicry piece of things. So I'd been collecting all of this information, starting to see all of these things. But it wasn't until I really stepped into a community to participate, to talk about these things, to basically to have the humility to say, I can't do this alone. I need help, that's when the potential came. That's when the quantum leaps happened in my own personal life from a health and wellness perspective, from all of these things that I've been thinking about starting to manifest. And that's what I think we've lost. Walk down the street and nobody even says hello to each other. We can't look each other in the eye. We do not see each other on the street then, Sarah. You and I might. We probably. Hey, good to see you. So do I. And I now make it like a point. And Who's that crazy hello. person? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what we need to remember. And there's this micro macro level that's happening that we've forgotten about. If we are not healthy in our bodies, if we are not comfortable in our skin, if we are not hydrated, if we're not functioning, if we're not doing all of those things, then we, we sit down at the dinner table with our families. When we come to work, when we do all of these things, we're not really bringing our whole selves. We're not functioning at our, our best, which means our communities aren't functioning. Do you think part best. of that is because our brains have not evolved at the same rate as society and technology have? Because when you think about even a decade ago, the number of connections that a single person had, it was closer to Dunbar's number of 150. Today, I don't know how many connections I have on LinkedIn, but it's definitely more than 15,000. And at some point, your brain, and maybe this is just my brain, uh, it like lets go of like holding on to information. And I had to literally retrain my brain to be like, this person is introducing themselves to me. Remember their name. Because I was just out there so much having conversations with thousands of people. I, I'm curious if, if any of your studies took you in that direction and if you've learned any ways personally to live more connected and in, in more in community even with the advent of a new social platform every year. No, I think it's interesting. There's some statistic out there that in 1900, what you learned your whole lifetime is the equivalent of what you learn in a day now. So we have all of this information and all of this people, and now we know we can look it all up again. So I do think the biggest thing for me is how am I present and where I am. How do you believe community and like that feeling of belonging in, in your community affects your physical health? I think you can't separate them. You just, you can't. It's the, 
It is the place where all the potential happens. It is the support system. It's how you go in and go. And you don't realize you need community until you need it, right? Like you don't realize it until there's a crisis in your life. And all of a sudden you look around and you're like, "Uh uh-oh, who am I going to call? And that's when the real panic and fear sets in. And so some of it is if you have it, there is this sense of security, right? And you're like, okay, I can try that because I know I have these people around me that are going to cheer me on, that are going to support me, that are going to really be honest with me. And I think that is some of what we've lost too in community is the way for us to sit around this table and for me to go, Toph, five years ago, you told me this. Mm -hmm. Or two weeks ago, you told me this. And this is how you wanted to live. And this is how you wanted to show up. Are you doing it? Right. Are you doing it in the way? Because I'm not sure you are, right? And to mm-hmm. say that in a, a loving way to help people grow. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that, that you're talking about you don't realize that you need community until the bad side when you have to look around and you need it. Or I am I'm such a, a big proponent of there are those times where people show up and your community shows up and like taking a moment, it's like step back and be grateful and just like bask all of that in. Like even in the hardest times when like people show up, I just am amazed. And I just take that in and I'm like, dang, I'm really lucky. I'm really fortunate that like we talked about on the at the event the like Brian Brown, Brene Brown, sorry, the one inch by one inch square and right all that stuff to get that feedback and that's super impactful. Of, hey, these 10, 5, 10 people, they're gonna be straight shooters with me and be so grateful for the community that we do have. It does wonders to like mental health and even I think physical health. I think there's some tie there, mm-hmm. but I, I don't have any research or anything to back it up. But just by the way I feel. But you just know. And part of that is it's fun right? You are laughing, right? That's good for your energetics, among other things. It resets your, and we need that. And in Icaria, Greece, which is one of the blue zones where people, they have the most centigenarians, they talk about it's not what you eat, it's who you eat with. And so they're always setting an extra place or two um, at the table. When I went to Italy in the, the spring, it was that same way. We stayed at this amazing villa, the villa owner and his wife who were making all the food joined us our guides joined us it was just like the more the merrier and it was this incredible sense of place and sense of people and i don't care what i saw in italy those dinners were the best because everybody's sitting around laughing about everything and nothing i just happened upon a photo because i was challenging myself last week at the powder keg event to find the earliest photo of every person who came on stage that, that was in the powder keg directory. And I was looking for the earliest photo of you and I, I found it. But in finding that, I found a photo of you, me, and maybe 20 other founders grabbing dinner at Scott Jones's house. Oh yeah. I don't know if you remember. I, I didn't awesome. remember it until I saw the photo. Yeah. And there's something about people going through similar experiences and sharing over a meal, which I think Paul Singh was in town from 500 startups. And like, we use that as a reason to be like, let's get all of our founders together and have a meal. And it was all all the kind of who's who of Indiana tech. And there's just something about sharing a meal that is magical. There is. And that is one of the things that we're doing with the human array that we're getting ready to kick off here soon, which is we're going to get people together to share a meal to share, we're calling it the wisdom, to share some wisdom. Where do I sign up? All right, I'll put you on my list. All right, perfect. And I'm and in. we're going to create these groups that come together, ideally monthly, and they don't even have to be the same group, but we think it's important to get people back together to talk about this, some of the stuff, and then to laugh and have fun and eat good food. I'd love to hear your perspective, right? Because if you think about it from a high level, society is the most connected that we've ever been digitally 17,000 like, technically we're so connected but yet there's like this loneliness epidemic right of like people feel more alone than they ever have and I'd, I'd just be curious to hear your opinion of like why getting people together in person in groups to break bread is so important I think you're 100 percent right that we are super disconnected and in part because we don't know who we can trust anymore you look around, you're like, mm, I don't know if I can trust my politician or my doctor or my church or my teacher. It's all in question. And at the same time, there's infinite everything. It's yeah, all coming to us, right. right? So it comes back to, okay, we do have this kind of ancient wisdom in us. 
think about it with evolution that doesn't just all like poof go away but we've forgotten to tap into it and it's in that sitting here and being able to look at somebody in the face to be able to hug them to touch them to feel the energetics that all of a sudden I just start by the way good (laughs) (laughs) that's gonna be a gift on the podcast episode for sure (laughs) i can't help but think about our core value trust yourself and how this all relates to that and in is an even deeper meaning of what we originally meant when we said trust yourself as a core value at powder keg but i do think that there's some level of like personal intuition that if you can cultivate that it can be one of the most powerful tools or skills you have. Mm -hmm. It totally can. And similar to what you're doing with powder keg, we're starting to amass what we call catalysts, the people that are making the changes because recognizing that, you know, your way in is not going to be my way in to this growth thing. I do think there are some kind of foundational types of things that everybody should be doing in their lives from a a health and wellness perspective. But, you know, for me, it may be, yoga and moving my body, um, for you may be breathing, right? It may be how I fuel myself. It may be that I need to sit in meditation. It may, and when you start to build that foundational level of health, then everything comes with it. But to have that community, both from a resource perspective and encouragement perspective, creates all the difference. Did we cover everything you wanted to cover, Tove? Because we we're, we're down to our eight, last. We need about eight more hours. I know. I was just. I, I knew know, you were going to say that. I know. We're, we're coming up to the mm-hmm. lightning round. Like uh, we literally could spend twelve hours. I know. Like, we didn't get to a half a dozen topics. Maybe next time we can do it over dinner. And, yeah, uh, exactly. Yes. Right. And, and at the wisdom, I think that'd be great. That would be cool. Yes, yeah. I do want to. But as we wrap up, you're in that. As Tove, we talked about the THC cannabis space. If we do have a lot of Indiana listeners, could we just get like a quick one to two minute flyover of where Indiana stands on all that stuff? Just so like people know what's being grown where and how they can leverage these resources in their everyday well-being. Sure. Yeah. Marijuana or cannabis, as some people call it, is currently not legal in the state of Indiana. I personally think there's a way for Indiana to do it and do it really well and do it in an Indiana fashion. And we can talk about that in in a different way so that we don't have the black market, so that we don't have all of these things. And we really do use it as a revenue stream and an avenue of health for people in Indiana who are otherwise just crossing the border to go get it and bring it back. Um, so that being said, hemp-derived products are... For the most part, legal. Delta 8's a little bit in question, but it is still generally being sold all over the state of Indiana. Delta 8 is essentially a cousin of marijuana. It has about two-thirds of the psychoactive properties. For some people that have have problems with the, the Delta 9, that it makes them anxious, Delta 8 can be a better, better product for them. There is also hemp-derived Delta 9, That's what my company, Shift Edibles, has gourmet chocolates that are milk and dark. Sounds like dessert for dinner, maybe. They are. (laughs) They're excellent. And I will tell anybody that is listening that if you go online to CBD Jubilee, that's where we're selling our products, in part because Alex, who's the owner of that company, used to have a store in Broad Ripple. I remember Uh, that. She just closed it, so she's all online now. But Alex is such a wealth of information about all things hemp, cannabis, how they interact from a health perspective, like ask Alex. She knows. We should and, just invite she her will. to our dinner. Yes, we should. There we she go. should start a website called Ask Alex, ask right? Alex. Mm-hmm. Ask tell Jeeves. Her. This is <laughs> Ask Alex, right? I went, to a, I went to a wedding once in Denver, and they had a five-course meal, and they did meal pairings, you know, like wine pairings. Yeah. But they did it with cannabis. That's wild. I could not hang. I could <laughs> not <laughs> hang. Five courses. It was insane. I was just like, how are you guys? Like, I am not on that level. Either. Awesome. And it's really funny because cannabis affects everybody differently, right? So if you're not a connoisseur, you don't really know in which different ways. And sometimes like Delta 9, people will be like, I don't feel anything. But with Delta 8, they will. It takes some time to figure out. And and like, why are you using it? What do you need it for? And that's where, again, Alex is a great resource. CBG is an awesome type of thing. If you need a pick-me-up and at the same time leveling out, Hmm. that's a great thing. 
So yeah, there's so many different ways to I go. I love it. This is a, that's a great little two minute resource for all of our Indiana listeners out there. But I do believe it's time for my favorite part of the show, the lightning round. Bum, bum. Yes. Oh, there's a yeah. bump, bump, bump. I now. added that. Yes, this wow. is new. So these are three quick questions. First thing that comes to your mind, lightning round. There are no wrong answers. And we're going to start with outside of the amazing entrepreneurial ecosystem. What is Indiana known for? Oh, I'm just trying to think. I think our Indiana is known for farming. Farming. Which is one of our greatest opportunities in this whole yes. upcoming world. True story. I drove my first combine on Saturday. Wow, I was congrats. harvesting corn. I got to no help, just me and a combine. Still have ones that are driven by humans. When you work on a small farm, yes, they do. Okay. Two thousand one International Harvester. That's it was awesome. Great. Um, sorry, that was totally off topic. But number two, what is a hidden gem in Indiana? I think if people haven't been down to Brown County and Shades and some of those types of our state parks, our state parks are you awesome. should definitely go. That's a great place to walk in the dirt. Get grounded it, down it, in Brown County. Get grounded. Get grounded. I yes. Love it. And ah. our final question of the lightning round. Who is someone we need to keep on our radar? Someone who is doing big things. Me. Boom. Yes. Bam. Yes. I love it. <laughs> boom. boom. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. This was a, a spectacular episode. Our most unique episode for sure. I would say I feel like I learned a punch and just I'm thinking about my body and just the way that works in a different way. And I appreciate that perspective. A little bit different than our normal kind of tech entrepreneurship business talk. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. And I will tell you just a, a plug for the human array is that we do work with companies and individuals because we do and communities because they're all nested, right? So it's how is you an individual? How are your people showing up? And we have a whole kind of thought process around creating living systems within your company, within your body, how that translates. So. I love that. Yeah, I, uh, just one quick final thought. This was really educational for me and, and made me think about things in an entirely different way. But my takeaway from this is the, criti the critical nature of authentically reconnecting is, has never been more important than now. And we're actually just on the tip of the iceberg of what's going to be required with the things that are going on in this world. And th th this is, I I'm going to be like reflecting on this pretty, pretty hardcore. It's really interesting that you just said ice tip of the iceberg. Uh, last time I was hanging out with Max Yoder, friend of the show, friend of the powder cake community, founder of Lessonly, we were just talking about the con conscious and subconscious mm -hmm. and that your consciousness being like the tip of the iceberg and I've lived a lot of my life thinking that was reality. That was all of reality was the tip of the iceberg. But you actually look below the surface and what's going on in subconscious, your dreams, uh, analyzing your dreams, being in touch and channeling the universe, whatever you want to call it, just like an amazing well of, of opportunity. And it's really interesting. Oh. I'm just... A well yeah. of wisdom. Maybe, maybe it's because of how we've been talking for the last hour. Well. There's connections. There's <laughs> things happening here. You just said iceberg. Yeah. There's something there. The, the happy trees in Michigan. Crazy. There's, <laughs> the, the dots are being connected here. It's here. Thank you so much. One final reminder to all listeners out there. If you send us three large shirts to 16 Tech addressed to Powder Keg in Indianapolis, we will give your company, your organization a shout out on the show. We'll talk about it. We'll wear them. You'll get all the jazz of our YouTube videos. We have videos. some for the next show. We do we have a special one for the next show. Some nice polos, actually. Somebody mm -hmm. coming off for us. So Watch out. We'll dive into that next time, but <laughs> thank you so much. This Sarah, was a this combo. was awesome. Thank, thank you so you much. Guys. Yeah, awesome. Great job. This has been Get In, a Powder Keg production in partnership with Elevate Ventures. And we want to hear from you. If you have suggestions for a guest or a segment, reach out to Matt or Nate on LinkedIn or on email. To discover top tier tech companies outside of Silicon Valley in hubs like Indiana, check out our newsletter at powderkeg.com slash newsletter. And to apply for membership to the Powder Keg executive community, check out powderkeg.com slash premium. We'll catch you next time and next week as we continue to help the world get in. Since you just listened to this podcast, you might be thinking about starting one for your company. Lucky for you, our partners over at Casted have you covered. Casted is the first and only podcast and video marketing platform made specifically for B2B brands. I love this about them. The platform makes it possible to publish, syndicate, amplify, and measure 
the value of your podcast and video content. In fact, we use it for our podcast here at Powder Keg. And if you're a startup, you should listen up because Casted for Startups is definitely for you. They are offering exclusive deep discounts of up to 82% off retail price for qualifying startups. Connect with Casted at casted.us slash powderkeg.